Improvisation can lead way to great moments in cinema. I'm not talking so much about comedy improvisation in this video, but rather dramatic. Comedic improvisation can lead to some great laughs, but it can also at times be a way around having a great script. Just hire some funny people and let them fill in the jokes. When I'm talking about improvising in a dramatic context, I'm talking about talented actors deeply engrossed in their characters, living truthfully in the moment. A well-known recent example is this scene in Django Unchained where Leonardo DiCaprio accidentally cuts his hand and incorporates it into the scene. Going back further, we can look at this quirky llama moment from Twin Peaks or this moment from Kramer vs. Kramer. I think many people tend to have this misconception that improvisation needs to happen right on set while the cameras are rolling, but that's not true. Ideas can be improv on set before shooting in the green room or, where the best improvisation often arises, during rehearsals, way before ever stepping foot on set. The llama moment was improvised on set when David Lynch found himself captivated by the llama, but the llama didn't just happen to walk straight through frame and stare longingly into the eyes of Dale Cooper. After the idea came up on set, the shot was framed to best capture the action, and Kyle MacLachlan had something in his mouth that attracted the llama to ensure he stopped to look right at him. David Lynch is a master of this kind of improvisation. Oftentimes his ideas come from the environments that he submerges himself into. Many iconic Twin Peaks moments are things that he came up with on set, including primary Twin Peaks antagonist Bob. Frank Silva was the set decorator, and Frank was uh, moving furniture around, and somebody said, a woman said, Frank, don't lock yourself in that room, because he had just moved a chest of drawers in front of the door. And I wasn't even looking in that direction, but the image of Frank locked in that room popped into my head. And I rushed to Frank and I said, Frank, are you an actor? And he said, why, I happen to, yes, be, happen to be. And I said, you're going to be in this movie. And he said, fantastic. And so I had Frank hide on one pan shot across Laura Palmer's bedroom, freeze down by the bars of the bed, and just be looking right at the camera. And we shot that. And I didn't know what I was going to use it for, no idea at all. And scenes are playing back in her head, and suddenly she sees something in her mind, bolts upright, and screams. And it tilts up and captures the scream perfectly. And I said, fantastic. And Sean says, no, it's not fantastic. I said, Sean, what is the matter? He said, someone was reflected in the mirror. I said, who was reflected in the mirror? And he said, Frank Silva was reflected in the mirror. And that's when I knew that Frank was part of the scene. I think that this kind of spontaneous idea generation is an integral element of the filmmaking process for Lynch. It was actually one of the grievances that he had with Twin Peaks to return, where he wasn't given quite enough time to soak in the worlds he was creating. Why do we only have two days? We're in stages. Why do we, why do you, why do we have to do we it in have, two days? Have... Why? We it's never right. get any extra shots. We never get any time to experiment. We never get to, you know, go dreamy or anything. We barely fucking make our days. I could have spent a week in the Fireman's. I love that place. And dream up all kinds of stuff. The moment highlighted from Kramer vs. Kramer arose from Dustin Hoffman being in character but off screen for Meryl Streep's performance. She's in the middle of her big scene when she looks over to Hoffman, who is providing her eye line. He did a simple in-character gesture that was so perfect for the moment, so true to both characters, that it got this reaction out of Meryl Streep, and director Robert Benton knew it needed to be incorporated. They reshot Hoffman's coverage to include the gesture he made. This is it. Were you a failure at the one most important relationship in your life? Were you? Is that a yes, Mrs. Kramer? It's just a little shake of his head, subtle, restrained, but it means so much to this other character, and the audience knows that. This small moment between these two actors and these two characters is what makes this entire climactic scene. We could go through examples of improvised moments all day, like De Niro's taxi driver scenes and tons of others, but hey, this isn't top 10 moments you didn't know were improvised. 
even if that might get more views. Let's look at a different film to zero in on a director giving their lead freedom in the moment. James Gray's debut feature Little Odessa isn't a perfect film, but it has a lot going for it and some really strong scenes. The story isn't all that original and the film is a little rough around the edges due to budgetary constraints. There's a scene where you can see a boom mic and another where you can see a piece of lighting equipment, but the performances are very strong and make up for the shortcomings, particularly the performances of Tim Roth and Maximilian Schell. These guys only have a couple of scenes together, but whenever they share the screen, it's electric. The best scene in the film actually happens sort of early on. Tim Roth is essentially a hitman who is visiting Little Odessa where he grew up and where his estranged family still lives. He loves his mom and little brother and hates his dad. And this is the scene where they see each other again for the first time in years. You guess what I got? Is that it? Josh. Don't you fucking hit him! Get out of my house. Out of my house, or I swear to you, you get belt. Get out of my house. Get out of my house. Get out of my house. You Fuck fucking you. man. Get out of my house. I'll, I'll fucking out. kill you. You fucking lay a hand on me. Get out. Get out, I said. The general premise and even flow of this scene is similar to scenes in other films, but it goes further. The way the scene is shot makes it feel like it's about to end, but then it keeps going. After the initial punch, there isn't any coverage for the father, just this one shot that holds on Tim Roth. The father spends the action either entirely out of frame or just barely in frame with his back to the camera. Roth is shouting past the camera, punching past the camera. It feels so in the moment, unstaged, unblocked as it continues. It feels like these two actors got caught up in the intensity and naturally extended the scene to wonderful effect. The second punch Roth throws and the others that he almost does, the snapping of the belt, there's a real sense of danger. A natural place for the scene to end would be right here. Get out of my house. Out! You go to your room! But the scene keeps going. Not much longer, but since we as audience members feel as though the natural conclusion has already passed, we have no idea what to expect or where things could go from here. The fact that we aren't cutting back and forth between the two makes us feel like the scene has already reached its ending. So every little bit of action and dialogue that happens after that point has an extra rawness that catches the viewer off guard. Let's take a look at a film that was built entirely upon improvisation and actor input. Vera Drake from director Mike Lay gives actors just about as much freedom as possible. The film had no script, though it was ironically nominated for Best Original Screenplay at the Oscars. All art in every medium is a synthesis of improvisation and order. In place of a script was an outline. The scenes were intensely rehearsed and the lines were ironed out through this rehearsal process. The basic outline of the story was planned and Mike Lay worked with the actors to figure out the rest. Parts of the story, including the real meat of the drama, were kept a mystery from the cast. Only the lead actress knew what the film was really about from the beginning. Vera Drake is a working class family woman who provides young desperate women with abortions in a time where the entire procedure was heavily illegal. Her family has no idea that she does this, and neither do any of the actors playing her family members, until this moment. Hold up. It's the police. Hey? Eh? Good afternoon. Sorry to interrupt your celebrations, but we need to talk to Mrs. Vera Drake. This is my wife. What's going on? Could you sit down, please, sir? Do as you're told, Sid. The actors in this heavily improvised film are finding out what Vera Drake does in this moment. And instead of Mike Lay telling them how to react, he allows them to decide in the moment how they feel their character would respond, how they would feel about this issue, how their opinion of their mother, their wife, their sister would change with the arrival of this news. Why'd you do it? I had to. It's wrong though, ain't it? Hey? I don't think so. Well, of course it is! It's little babies. I mean, you hear about these things. You read about it in the papers, but you don't expect to come home to it on your own doorstep with your own mum. You ain't got no right. That's enough, Sid. Oh, what? So what are we supposed to do then, eh? 
Sit round playing happy families, pretending like nothing's happened. I said that's enough. You lied to us. No, she never. She did. She never told us, but she never lied. It's the same thing. No, it ain't. This is true reacting in its purest form from great actors thoroughly engrossed in fully formed characters. If you know what you're going to do before you do it, what is the point of doing it? Not even Imelda Staunton, who plays Vera Drake, knew that this would be the scene where her secret was revealed. We're having a party today. Can I sit down, please? Yes, of course. I don't I want to spoil it for my family. Can't you come back tomorrow? None of the family members were told about the arrival of the police ahead of time, and the police had no clue what sort of reaction the family members would have ahead of time, because they didn't know themselves. Shooting like this opens up such a wide range of possibilities, and Mike Lay's directing style allows for absolute actor freedom and character truth. Every single actor in the entire film gives a phenomenal performance, but just to really highlight Imelda Staunton, her performance is one of the best I've ever seen, bar none, top five leading actress performances of all time, easily. The performance I consider number one is actually one that I'm going to make a separate video essay about soon, so stay tuned for that. Not all directors rehearse extensively with their actors, sometimes for budgetary reasons or scheduling reasons, or sometimes they just choose not to. Directors like Clint Eastwood and Ridley Scott have reputations for being assembly line directors, at least nowadays. How, what's it like working with Clint? He treats us like horses. <laughs> Clint goes like this, and everybody else goes like this. <laughs> which means you're rolling, and then he's standing right next to you, and he says, okay, go ahead. <laughs> and then you do it. And maybe you'll say, just, just take that again. Just do it one more time. And then you do it, and he says, all right, that's enough of that. They rarely do more than a couple of takes, and the actors are often left to figure out their performances on their own. Now, Ridley Scott is iconic, legendary director, and he's famous for getting very few takes. Like, the thing I've always heard about Ridley Scott is he gets... This is like four. Does like four takes. A lot of directors will do like 50 takes, and so that's comfortable for the actor because they get a lot of chances at it. With him, it's like he does two, three, maybe sometimes four takes, and then he's like, I'm moving on. Yeah. That's got to be intimidating. Well, he sets up like four cameras, and that's it. Like, he has a bunch of cameras, but you don't really notice them, and then you get like kind of three, four chances. Like, he doesn't say that, but he's just like, he's always like, great, moving on. Like, so you kind of feel as an actor, you kind of bring it. Leaving an actor to their own devices might sound like it allows them a lot of freedom to explore, but the opposite is actually true. If you know your director is likely only going to do a couple of takes, maybe just a single take, and you haven't worked out the scene together ahead of time, then you have essentially no room at all in which to experiment and explore the character and situation. You're forced to stick to what you know will work for sure, the straightforward approach. Good performances from good actors can arise from this, but I think it's hard to get a great one this way. On the other hand, extensive rehearsals might sound as though they would limit an actor's freedom, but again, the opposite is true. Mike Lay spent six months rehearsing with his actors for Vera Drake developing their characters and finding the truth in these fictional people. There is no structure at all. There is no um, five or three act structure or anything else. There is a feeling, a concept, uh, a notion, possibilities. Um, but the time we get to the point before the shoot, there is a structure, a broad structure, which I I do put on very briefly on paper in a very schematic way. He worked with the actors to craft their biography from their birth till the beginning of the film. Before rehearsing as a group, Mike Lay met with each of the actors individually to flesh out all of their personal nuances and make them as real as possible. The actors didn't start working with one another until their characters met. By spending so long rehearsing, you aren't hammering in lines said in a specific way. You're allowing ultimate, uninhibited freedom within that period of time. The actors are free to try anything, to experiment, to play within their characters' headspace to understand them more fully. It's a collaborative process as they work with Mike Lay to craft the character. Another director who rehearses in this way is one of my all-time favorite filmmakers, Sidney Lumet. He's the man behind some of the best films ever made. Twelve Angry Men, Dog Day Afternoon, Serpico, Network, and many others. Lumet's films have often been noted for the strength of their performances. This comes from his unusual practice of rehearsing with his actors for a couple of weeks before he starts shooting. There's always a lot of talk about great rehearsal in the film, but there's very few directors that do it. Just, it's a pleasure because uh, uh, you explore the character, you explore the situation, uh, nothing is set in stone. I think only through exploration 
of all the possible things can you really improvise. Let's focus in on Dog Day Afternoon, the film that I will fight to the death has Al Pacino's best performance. It's him at his most manic, his most vulnerable, his most real. What were they doing back there? I don't know what the fuck they were doing Yeah, back you don't there. know. You're full of That's shit. That's another force back there. A tactical force. A tactical they like force, shoot. They right. like to jump yeah. on ropes. They like to climb into a window. They like it, right. Without they your like orders, right? Without your orders. Without your orders. Uh, no, yes, without my orders, yes. yes. How do I know you're not going to come through the roof? Because I'm telling you that we're not. Yeah, you're telling me a lot of things, but you're not doing them. Oh, well, God damn what I told you that we had What were they doing thing? back there? That's I what I don't know what they were doing you back can't there. Answer me, damn, right? out here. You can't answer me. What? You can't answer me. Yes, I can answer you. So well, you tell me what they were doing there. Shut up there. By the way, if you ever spot me in real life shouting Attica, this is why. Yeah. He wants to kill me so bad he can taste it. Oh, God, I was going to kill you. Attica! 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 Dog Day Afternoon is based on a true story. It's not an adaptation of a book, but was instead inspired by an article covering a real-life bank robbery. There was a screenplay written by Frank Pearson, which actually ended up winning the Oscar, but Sidney Lumet only followed the script's structure. He disregarded almost all of the dialogue and instead worked with Al Pacino and the rest of the cast to discover the lines through improvisation during rehearsals. The improvisation continued onto the set in this freeform style of character work, especially from a hardcore method acting Al Pacino, is the main reason why this film has such an incomparable energy to it. Pacino barely slept during filming, and he let his body fall apart to maintain the strung out energy of his character for the duration of the shoot. He even had to be hospitalized and take a break from film work after they wrapped production. The lengthy phone call scene was also entirely improvised and shot in just a single take. They spent an entire day on this one scene, no air conditioning to further add to the realism of Pacino's sweaty live wire performance. After finishing a perfect take, Lumet had him go again from the beginning straight away to capture the authentic fatigue Pacino was feeling in that moment that matched his characters. Dog Day Afternoon feels so real because so much of it was real, lived in the moment within character. Even the famous Attica shouting scene was improvised. Incredible things can happen when you pair a top-of-his-game actor with a world-class director who knows exactly how to give him the kind of freedom he needs to experiment, while also creating an environment to bring out his best and organize the filming in an unobtrusive way to best allow for this kind of performing. Lumet would use multiple cameras at different angles to catch genuine reactions without forcing his actors to stick to pre-planned blocking. He would have backup cameras ready for matching angles to record extremely lengthy takes. This was back when film cameras could only really shoot for 10 minutes at a time. Lumet used the situations from the script as a starting point to explore with his cast their way through the emotions and actions from the headspaces of their fully developed characters. Lumet would then transcribe the lines established through rehearsal into what ended up becoming the screenplay submitted to the Academy. In his book simply titled Making Movies, Sidney Lumet goes into great detail about his rehearsal process. Rehearsals would go on for long periods of time, always starting early in the morning and going through the day. He is responsible for bringing out some of the best performances in American cinema, and hearing insights into his process is a great resource. I would highly recommend the book to anyone interested in directing. I read it in between two different productions and it really changed the way that I approached rehearsals with actors. A fantastic read if you're serious about your craft and relatively new to the industry. A mantra within the Meisner technique is, acting is living truthfully within imaginary circumstances. When great actors are given the freedom to experiment and explore within character, great results can arise. Extensive rehearsals can be freeing rather than limiting and can help both directors and actors get to the heart of the truth that everyone is attempting to portray. If you're an actor or director, then maybe this video gave you something new to try, whether it be a new approach, a new technique, or just a new way to think about a particular situation. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like and share it around to help this channel grow. Make sure you subscribe and stick around for more content. I'll see you in the next video, and yes, this is my real voice. I just sound like this.